Right, okay, so the storage devices. It's really important that we are aware of the difference. So we have something called primary storage and we have something called secondary storage. They're fundamentally the same thing. They store things. Okay? Binary data for us. But how they work, there is one massive fundamental difference. Primary storage is the only storage that the CPU can access. That's why it's called primary storage. Right, that has a knock-on effect. What we mean by that is, if we have got some data that we want the CPU to process, or we have got some instructions that we want the CPU to execute, they must be in primary storage. Okay? And in general, the only primary storage that we have in a computer system is RAM and ROM. Okay? So obviously there's a difference between RAM and ROM. One's read-write, one's volatile, one's not. But they are both accessible by the CPU. So if I've got a program in memory, the CPU can execute it. The problem is, RAM is temporary. When I turn the power off, I lose everything. So it's not practical for long-term storage to have everything in RAM. If we want long-term storage, that's what we use secondary storage for. So when we're not using our computer and we want to save our files, we save them to secondary storage. But the CPU cannot access. So it's not an alternative to RAM. Okay? It's an addition. It's additional storage. If we've got a file that we want to process, let's say we've got a picture that we're editing in Photoshop, if it's stored on our SSD or our hard disk, then in order for the CPU to manipulate that image, it has to be loaded into primary storage, into RAM. Couldn't load it into ROM, could we? Because you can't write to ROM. Okay. So we would load it into RAM, then we could process it. If we've got a program that we want to execute, we want to play a game that we've got saved on our hard drive, we have to load it into RAM first. The other problem we've got is that secondary storage is much larger than RAM. Okay, so you might have like, I don't know, if you've got a fancy computer, amount of 16 gig of RAM, but 16 gig of secondary storage is nothing, is it? You know, it's a USB stick, 16 gig. You're more likely to have a couple of terabytes of secondary storage. So, what that means is, not everything can fit in RAM. And that's where virtual memory comes in. Okay, so we have got a finite amount of RAM. We load up the programs and the data we want to manipulate. You know, so the CPU can access them. At some point, RAM may get full. When that happens, what we can do is we can implement a system called virtual memory. So let's just show how virtual memory works. So I'm not talking about the specific devices. I'm keeping it pretty general. Okay, this is general stuff. Right, so virtual memory. Right, the CPU, and this is the whole thing with virtual memory, can only access our primary store, our RAM. So the, the CPU sees that. When it's full, what we've got to do, and this is the job done by the operating system, 
Okay? It's one of the functions of operating systems. Remember we said um, ages ago, operating systems are basically managers. They manage the resources of the computer. Memory is one of those resources. Secondary storage is another of those resources that it manages as well. So it's ideally suited to manage this whole virtual memory process. So what we do on our secondary storage device we have something called the swap file. And its name is the clue to how all this works. The swap file. So when I fill memory up, and I go, oh, but I want to load another program, what the operating system has to do is it says, Okay, there is this, this bit of stuff, this bit of memory, we haven't been using that lately, so let's swap it and copy it to the secondary storage device, our hard drive, or our SSD. What that does is frees a little bit of space up so that we can load our program into main memory so the CPU can execute it. Now, it's not as simple as that because... All the programs we're trying to run want the CPU to access them. So what we tend to find happens is there is a continual process of saying, this isn't being used, save it in the swap file. We want to use this, take it from the swap file and load it into RAM. So there is a two-stage process. So if there's a program that is in the swap file that we need to access, first... We copy it into main memory, then we can execute. When we're finished with it, temporarily, we can put it back in the swap file and make space. So it's all about making space. So the process of using virtual memory, there is a cost. And the cost is the time it takes to transfer data to and from the secondary storage device and main memory. Now we can speed this up depending on what storage device we use. So what are the two standard big mass storage devices that we've got for secondary storage? Yeah, we've got hard disk, a, a, the physical mechanical thing. What's the one that's becoming a lot more common? The SSD, solid state. Okay, so in general, the way these, these work to the operating system, they're just storage devices. But physically how they work is completely different. A hard drive has got a magnetic surface that spins really fast. In the fastest ones, you get 10,000 revolutions a minute. That's like the sort of speed that a saw goes at. And you could cut wood with these. There's some crazy videos on YouTube of people opening up hard drives and unscrewing things. And there's a really good one, I'll try and find it later, of someone unscrewing a hard drive, sticking it on the end of the desk, letting it speed up and then nudging it so all these disc platters come off and then go flying across the room and up a wall. So they made a curve for them to go up. I'll show you the video of that, it's really good. Um, but yeah, they're spinning really quick. But it's a mechanical process. There is an arm with a head. And to read and write data to a hard drive, you've got to wait for the disk to spin to the right location and for the head to move over the, where the bit of data is. So that takes time. Okay. With an SSD, you've basically got just a permanent version of RAM. It operates nowhere near the same speed as main memory, but what advantage it does have is that it is random access. Right, that's how we, we call RAM random access memory, don't we? What does that actually mean? What does random access mean? Go on, Timothy. Yeah. Right, that's part of it. Okay. 
If you think about this hard drive, we have to wait for something to appear in the right place so we can read it. With an SSD, because it's random access, what that means is, if I try and read from the SSD in that location, that it takes a certain amount of time. Okay, so I have to like retrieve the information. If I do it from this location, it takes exactly the same amount of time. It does not matter where I read from a random access device, the time is the same. <coughs> okay, so you can actually really tightly estimate how long it will take to transfer data to and from. And because it's random access, it's quicker. With the hard drive, you've got blocks of data. If that's where the head is, it needs to move to the outside area, then it needs to wait for that to, I mean, it's spinning fast. So when we say it has to wait, it's not like it's going, oh, that, that disc, I'm just waiting for that disc to come round. It's not like a, a little turntable, it's going fast. But it, that is, a, speeds matter in computers, okay? And if something only appears under the head, thousand times a second, that is slow compared to a random access device. So when you say random access memory, we mean that it doesn't matter which memory location you access, the time taken is the same. An SSD works like that. Okay? You've still got to do the copy of the data, so that's the time, you know, copying the data takes time. So there's always that cost. But the retrieval cost on an SSD is less than a hard drive. So if you want to speed a computer up, Put an SSD in it first, then get and get more RAM. If you can't afford a new processor, that's the two options you've got to speed a computer up. As much RAM as you can afford or put in the device, and then swap hard drives for solid state. Solid state's massively expensive compared to a hard drive though. You know, you can get two terabyte, I know because I've got them in my laptop, two terabyte SSDs, but they cost about 400 quid. A two terabyte hard drive would cost you, if you can find one, probably 30 quid. There's a massive difference in cost. What you can do in an operating system like Windows, you can specify a particular drive to use as a swap drive. So what you could do is get a small SSD and say, I'm not going to put my programs on it, but I'm going to use it for my virtual memory. And then your virtual memory will be as fast as it can be. So you can do things like that. But the fundamental thing is that the CPU cannot see things on a secondary storage. Virtual memory uses secondary storage. So anything in secondary storage has to first be copied or swapped into memory. Because we're using virtual memory because memory is full, in order for that swap to happen, we have to remove something from memory and put it in the swap. And the operating system's constantly juggling this. What can happen, your worst case scenario is you get what we call disk threshing. Now with an SSD you don't hear this, but if you've got a hard drive in your computer and you can hear your hard drive going all the time, going like that, what, what's happening is you're spending all your time swapping things in and out of memory to the swap drive. And you actually never get around to actually running any programs. And it can totally kill the performance of your computer. Okay? So if you're in situations where you are basically having to swap all the time, you need more memory. You need more RAM. Okay? So that's what you want to avoid. The only way to stop that disk threshing if you can't increase your memory is to reduce the amount of programs you're running. Or the size of the data that you're trying to manipulate. But that's not always, you know, possible. If you're working on a massive um, A0 poster in Photoshop, the chances are that that poster will not wholly fit in memory, because it'd be huge. So you will have to, as you're editing parts of the picture, they're going to be going in and out of the swap drive. Okay. Right, anyone got any questions about this storage and virtual memory? It's really important on the virtual memory that you talk about its secondary storage, so anything there can't be accessed by the CPU, so it has to, so this, that's why we have the swap process. Okay? Yes? No one around copying the data. Does 
The RAM doesn't do anything. The RAM is just storing data. Is it? It's not doing the copying. The operating system requests the copy. Oh, okay. Right. So this literally like taking the information out. So that so secondary storage doesn't have any information when it's given back. Storage. Yeah. Uh, effectively, what you've got is you've got the way that. The way this, let me just go a little bit more detail than what we need. For this to work, main memory is split into something called pages. Okay? The swap file is sometimes called the page file. Now, it might be that you have got enough memory to store 10,000 pages. But you want 15,000 pages. So the swap file would hold the additional 5,000 pages. So this is our RAM and this is our swap. I'm simplifying it a little bit. So if I have got 100 pages that I want to access, what I've got to do is find 100 pages that are in RAM and say, right, I don't need those at the minute. So they can go in, and these can go in their place. Okay, so you have what we call 15,000 logical pages, but we have only got 10,000 physical pages in memory. So it's, a, it's, just, it's just about organisation. It's a bit like having um, work on your desk and then using the floor as the rest of your storage at home. How many of you will do that system? No, you're quite tidy? I used to have a mate at university who used to, he didn't used to use a desk, but he did use the floor as his storage device. And it was just, you, you couldn't see his carpet or paper. Right, you're going to ask a question, go on. So is there a limit to how much the swap can hold? How big is your secondary storage device? So if you, you know, if we've got the capability to store one million pages, you can have one million pages. But if you, if you need that many pages, you're going to be getting your operating system and your CPU doing a lot of work copying stuff in and out. So if you get a massive imbalance like that, then really you need to look at more RAM. In general, Windows controls the size of the swap file, and it tends to make it about one and a half times the size of your RAM. So if you've got eight gigabytes of RAM, it'll go, oh, we'll make the swap file 12 gigabytes. All right. If it starts getting way, way bigger than that, then the performance is going to die on the computer. Okay? Right. I'll stop that one there.